Hi, this is Sally and welcome to Reclaiming Pride, LGBT plus survivors of narcissistic abuse. Before we start, there is a trigger warning. The episodes of this podcast may at times refer to domestic violence, emotional, financial and sexual abuse. To begin, I'd like us to have a one word feelings check. That is, what is one word for how you are feeling in this moment? Not how people around you are feeling or how somebody you might be caring about is feeling, but how are you feeling right now in this moment? It's a centering technique. So this week, we'll be looking at a question which puzzles many people who do not have experience with abusive relationships. Why did we stay? I hope this episode will provide you with answers and also ways to explain to someone who doesn't understand when they ask you the question, why didn't you just leave? First of all, let's start off with the enigma of the narcissistic trap, Why do we fall for narcissists, especially when many of us have experienced similar dynamics before, possibly even in childhood? It's a question that haunts us. It haunts many survivors. The answer lies in the narcissist's masterful manipulation. They arrive with this seduction. It's like a they lure you into this seductive sea of love bombing. They arrive with an arsenal of charm, charisma and confidence a potent cocktail, which we'll just call the love bombing stage. These excessive displays are meant to distract. They lure us away from critical thinking and a deeper understanding of who this person truly is. Please don't confuse your falling for this person having anything to do with either your IQ or your EQ. A lot of it can actually be tied into inherited trauma and trauma from childhood and previous relationships that leaves you open to believing someone like this. By the time the early love bombing fades, we're already invested. Relationships require work, right? Well, that's often what we'll say to each other and to ourselves when things really go awry. This societal norm becomes our justification for staying, even in the face of abuse. And I'm not just talking about a few pink flags. I'm talking about genuine red flags. I'm talking about emotional, mental, physical, financial abuse. A sense of duty, cultural or religious beliefs, finances, routine, a fear of starting over, and even pity can all become anchors keeping us tethered in this relationship. So at this point, you're kind of either in the grip of fear or you're just paralyzed by insecurity and not really knowing what your next step should be because this person's kind of taken away your sense of self for the most part. So you have a hard time making decisions. But the most potent force with this individual that makes you stay is fear. Fear of loneliness, fear of starting anew, and the insidious belief that maybe, just maybe, this is as good as it gets. This is what I deserve. The narcissist has systematically eroded your self-confidence, leaving you riddled with self-doubt. Then there's the gaslighting stage. And yes, they will gaslight us till the cows come home, but I'm talking about when we gaslight ourselves. And this is a true recipe for misery. This toxic dynamic dismantles trust in our own judgment. So we then begin to believe the problems are temporary, that we are overreacting. And it doesn't help that the narcissist will also tell you that you're overreacting as well, kind of further vindicating this feeling. We fall into the trap of trying harder, loving harder, loving more, sacrificing endlessly in a futile effort to fix things. A narcissistic courtship isn't a relationship. It's a form of indoctrination. It's a form of brainwashing. Then there are the untold scars, the things that we don't dare to speak or we're ashamed to admit. This is also what leaving an abusive relationship can feel like, and it causes a war inside yourself. The question of why stay in abusive relationships feels a bit trite. It's overused, yet it glosses over the brutal reality of abuse's grip on our mind, our body, and our spirit. We readily acknowledge the PTSD of war veterans, right? I mean, it's obvious, but the invisible battle wounds of childhood or domestic abuse, 
either to ourselves or having witnessed it as a child with one of the adults that was supposed to be caring for us, this is often dismissed. A major reason why adults stay trapped lies in the wreckage of childhood trauma. Trauma scars the brain, leaving its mark on decision-making. The amygdala, our fight-or-flight commander, becomes hypervigilant, while the prefrontal cortex, crucial for logic and learning, gets sidelined. This doesn't mean you're broken, but it does explain why leaving feels irrational. Survivors like us often describe a confusing mental fog, and I spoke about this in an earlier episode, riddled with constant distraction and paralyzing self-doubt. It's not a matter of simply thinking it through and walking out. Trauma disrupts the communication between the brain's emotional and rational centers, making clear thinking and planning a Herculean task. This is why professional support is vital to help survivors like us process the trauma and reclaim control of our own narrative. From the outside, leaving seems well like a simple choice, right? Survivors, however, face a labyrinth of challenges. First, there's cognitive dissonance. The struggle to reconcile the abuser's charm with the brutal reality of their actions. Who are they really? It's been said before that the person that you see at the end of a relationship is who they always were. Then there's conditioning. The abuser's unpredictable cycle of good times and abuse creates a confusing mix of hope and fear, keeping the victim tethered. Then there's CPTSD, the complex trauma born from repeated or prolonged abuse. So the C stands for complex, all right? So in other words, the trauma doesn't just emerge from one place in your life. It could, have, it could be a compounding and a complexity of trauma that you've withstood from childhood, maybe through adolescence, maybe in other relationships that were also abusive. So it's compounded, it's complex. So CPTSD. Then there's trauma bonding. This is an unhealthy attachment formed through a twisted combination of fear and manipulation. I remember the trauma bond with my ex was extremely strong. Um, and, you know, it, it, it surpasses all else, listeners. You know this. If you've been through this, you know this as well as I do. It surpasses all else. It, it has nothing to do with your IQ. It has nothing to do with your, with your emotional intelligence quotient. The trauma bond will surpass all else. Then there's low self-esteem. The abuser's relentless criticism erodes your self-worth, leaving you questioning your own sanity. The narcissist is not a master of many things, but what they are a master of is deception. Leaving a narcissistic abuser is especially daunting. Skilled manipulators deny abuse, so they'll use things like gaslighting and project a perfect public image, so that if you present this to anybody else, then they'll you will look like you are the abusive one or the crazy one, or that you're overreacting or making it up. They will manufacture it that way. I remember with my ex, um, once it was her birthday and she'd been extremely abusive and we had actually, I'd actually met her at a restaurant for her birthday and we hadn't spoken for a while because of the abuse. And um, she started putting on this really strange kind of upset act and started, you know, crying and things like she was extremely hurt that I didn't really want to be there and that I wasn't having full joy in celebrating her. And I just, I just tried to get through it as best I could. And I tried to be kind. I had a gift. I had a card. I had, you know, all the things, but I just, it was just awful. And I was actually scared of her. And I remember her shutting me out of the car afterwards and putting her phone on speaker and talking to her then boss at her job and saying how abusive I was being. And I was locked out of the car and it was cold and it was raining and I was knocking on the window to be let in. And I could literally hear her lying to this person. Um, on really loud speakerphone. So she did that so that I could hear both sides of the conversation. And her boss was, who probably didn't know any better because she'd shown this mask outside of the relationship, obviously. Her boss was saying, well, you know, if she wants to be like that to you, you know, you should just get away from her and all of this. It was just really, really awful. We grapple with self-doubt. We question our own reality. And I remember standing in the rain that night and wondering, Am I the abuser? Am I being awful to her right now? 
Abusers often present a charming facade at first. We know this. Then it's followed by a slow, molasses-like, insidious degradation of our self-esteem. It's sometimes even hard to pinpoint the exact moment where it took a turn because it's so skillful. The healing process is a marathon. It's not a sprint. The recovery time depends on the duration of the abuse. So the survivor's support system and the severity of the trauma. And don't forget, this can all be compounded by previous trauma. Remember, abuse can strike anyone regardless of their past as well. You kind of, you could have even had a reg, a, a regular childhood, a, a happy life up until then. But then you find yourself in this situation with this awful person. To leave someone like this is a fear of the unknown. It's a leap into uncertainty. Leaving also means facing an uncertain future. Healthy relationships involve mutual respect, even after breakups oftentimes. Narcissistic abusers, however, may resort to stalking, smear campaigns, or even violence to punish the survivor for daring to escape. The longer the abuse continues, the deeper the impact on self-worth. Abusers exploit our self-doubt to maintain control. They they can smell self-doubt, just like a non-human animal can smell fear. They, I, I believe they can too. Survivors may have been confident before the relationship, but the constant belittling creates a sense of learned helplessness. This is precisely why breaking free is so crucial. Abuse victims are often conditioned to accept crumbs of affection amidst the harsh harsh criticism. So the cycle of abuse normalizes this behavior, making it difficult to recognize a healthier dynamic eventually. So we might compare ourselves to others in seemingly happier relationships, perpetuating the cycle of self-doubt. But there is self-worth beyond this abuse, I promise you. Abusers manipulate their victims with comparison creating a distorted reality where the victim feels responsible for the abuse. I remember this happened constantly with me. My ex, she would she would compare me to her exes constantly. It was almost like we were there were three people in the relationship sometimes. This is known as triangulation. It's important to remember that abusers abuse. Their behavior is a reflection of them. It's not the victim's worth. It's not your worth. It's nothing to do with your intelligence. It's nothing to do with the way you look, the way you sound, the way you dress, what you eat, the way you eat, the way you walk, the way you sit, all of the things that are criticized about you. Listener, it has absolutely nothing to do with you. Everything that was placed on you, everything that was screamed at you or thrown at you are all the ways that the narcissist feels about themselves. I know it's hard to believe, but it's part of the pathology and it's in it's in medical journals. This is the way that the person functions. Please believe me, you may not be there yet, but it isn't you. Leaving an abuser is not about proving anything to them. It's about reclaiming your life. This is why I ask you at the beginning of every one of these podcasts, what's one word for how you are feeling in this moment? I'm trying to center you back to yourself. It's not selfish. It's just that you have been through something that has been depersonalizing and torturous and you need to come back to your own peace. Your journey to wholeness is about self-discovery, shedding toxic people-pleasing habits and embracing your self-worth. It's about building healthy boundaries and finding and experiencing the liberating power of true freedom. And it might take you a long time to do that. I'm still discovering even some of the simple things around being free. And it's every day holds something new. It's an amazing thing. Leaving and maintaining no contact is a victory, believe me. It's a turning point that signifies the survivor's strength and agency. The healing journey is not easy, but it's incredibly transformative. Self-blame is a common consequence of abuse, but forgiveness and self-compassion pave the way to true healing. The next time you question why someone stayed, remember the unseen battles fought and the immense courage required to either physically, emotionally, or both break free. It's a journey of self-discovery, reclaiming pride, and ultimately 
finding your freedom. Please note, this podcast is not intended to replace professional therapy or counselling. It serves as a supplementary resource for support and encouragement. Listeners, you are encouraged to seek professional help if needed. I did, and it still works for me today. Stay tuned, and I look forward to healing with you again next time. Bye-bye.